The kids are all right on today's Unnamed Real Estate Podcast. (laughs) Got to give that little time for the music to fade out. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charles Ray Dawson. This is the Unnamed Real Estate Podcast, and I am the associate broker, residential sales manager, and still slightly hungover, you know, guy at ProStar Realty. And I hope you guys are having a great day. So the reason for it is because at uh, Rosie McCaffrey's last night, we had a baby shower with um, karaoke. And if you sing a song that included the words baby in it, You got a tiny little token that you could turn in for a drink of pinkish death, which, of course, you have to drink because, hey, you know, it's a baby shower drink toast of child. And wound up having a really fascinating conversation with a couple young men out in uh, the parking lot about philosophy, the existence of God, and Lord of the Rings, and um, Tolkien, and all sorts of stuff. And... You know, not only did we close the bar down, but we closed the parking lot down afterwards. So that was a lot of fun till this morning. And then it wasn't a lot of fun. But it's Thursday. I got to record a show. And here we go. So <clears throat> a lot of fun news going on this week. And um, I want to wrap the whole thing up on that. But let's lead with the news first. And then we'll talk about what I want to talk about on this. So first things first, uh, news-wise, uh, we got Cromford stuff. And we have... National News has picked up that home prices have actually fallen. Hear this out. They have actually fallen, not just asking prices, but the prices themselves, right? For the first time in three years last month, right? And they're calling it the biggest decline since 2011, right? Now, so you know, the overall average nationwide, remember, real estate is local, but this is national numbers, right? Overall fell 0.77 0.77 of a percent. All right. So <clears throat> you can work at the math out in your head. That's not even a 1% drop, <clears throat> but it is still a drop. Biggest areas that were impacted seem to be the coast. Um, got a couple of little highlighted parts right here. Um, where is the one where San Jose was the leader? They're down 10%. All right. In the recent months, followed by Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, and Denver. Right? Phoenix was not on this list. Arizona was not on the list, although I can tell you we probably dropped. And we got some numbers to show that coming up. But, um, yeah, it is. we definitely did have that downturn that we've been looking at and experiencing through. And that's why we run the numbers weekly so we can start seeing these trends before they actually show up on the radar on the national news site. So... One of the big words that came out of this is the concept of affordability. Now, affordability is the term, you know, economists and whatnot track and use to say how much of your income are you going to need to provide housing for yourself, right? Because remember, housing is not a luxury, all right? It's a requirement, It's an essential, it's a necessity, right? Unless you want to live in the van down by the river, or nowadays it's one of the tents tents set up on the corners of Camelback or around Indian School Park up against the fence there, or pretty much any alleyways. You know, you drive, you know, downtown Phoenix right now, we got these little tents popping up all over the place like mushrooms. Um, You know, unless that's your kind of lifestyle you want to aim for, you're going to have to find some sort of housing. So it's the affordability and how much of your you know, monthly take-home income is going to housing you and yours. So um, housing affordability is at its low level in the last 30 years, right? They're saying that it requires 32.7% of the medium household income to purchase an average home using a 20% down payment on a 30-year mortgage, right? And coming up with 20% down is pretty hard. Right, and that's why we have lenders out there who have other programs. All right, now, I'm not just talking the first time homebuyer program, but that's part of the reason why FHA exists. All right, three and a half percent down. All right, three and a half percent down is what would that come to? Like fourteen thousand on a four hundred thousand dollar house. I check my math on that one because I really suck at doing math in my head. But you know, you 
that kind of stuff, VA loan, a course, zero down. You're still paying closing costs. Don't think you just sign a piece of paper and get a house, all right? You are going to have closing costs on those things, all right? But you don't have that big down payment that you need to come in with. And remember, guys, you can use your VA loan over and over and over again. It's not a one-shot deal, all right? If you are a veteran, you have interest in whether or not you want to and qualify for a VA loan, give me a call. I'll hook you up with one of my lenders. My lenders will have a conversation with you about that, all right? So now with affordability right now being at 32.7, all right, um, that is well above, it's 13 per points more than when the uh, pandemic kicked off, all right? When we've seen those spike in house prices. And remember, it's not just the house price. It's also the interest rates, all right? That spike of interest rates that we got earlier this, um, this spring, early summer that kicked off all, all this craziness that's what's really jammed everything up in there and we were really pushing the line right there as was before the interest rates piled on and that's why we're starting to see reducing pricing reduce amount of closing but we've got some good news over here that i'm going to be getting to in a bit but yeah the 25 25 year average for affordability <coughs> is a uh, 23.5 all right so that shows you how much we've, we've gone up I think we're, we are definitely seeing a correction on these things. Interest rates have come down as lenders realized that nobody was taking their product, money, at the rates that they were selling it at, the interest. And so they lowered their prices, and now you know we have come off of that six we were looking at. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the numbers, all right? And then right after going to the numbers, we're going to come back. I'm going to talk to the Cromford Report. I'm going to talk to you about this article right here. All right? And I'm going to tell you the story of a young man who is winning at adulting without naming his name. Now the numbers for August 24th, 2022. Actives this week are 18,617, up 132 from last week. New listings were 2,221, down 263. Pendings are 1,325, down 125. Under contracts by looking for backups are 869, up 37. Contracts with a buyer contingency is 122, up 18. Closings last week were 1,345. Coming soon to an MLS near you is 738 new listings. And our Crawford report numbers showing that demand is at 79.2 and supply is at 73.3. So as you can see, we've been talking about the flow of new listings coming on board has been slowing over the last couple of weeks. And we can see that the amount of new contracts are starting to increase. And this is, you know, showing you, and you can sit there and sort of look back at the interest rates and see how that sort of happened. Um, once again, I, if I could get my screen share program working on this, I'd be explaining to you that using the little charts and graphs I have set up. But we, we are starting to see the, the, the flattening out of the new inventory coming on it's and remember we're, we're talking about the delta the rate of change right um we you, every day there's going to be a house showing up on the market right we we get excited when there's more than we expect right every day a house is going under contract right now right and we get it we get excited when all of a sudden there's less of them happening but we are we are seeing basically the summer of craziness appears to be coming to an end um Cromford report, you know, with, with their daily reports and stuff. I noticed that they officially declared the market to be balanced on August 19th, exactly 12 hours after I announced on last week's podcast that this is a balanced market. So I beat them to the headline, right? Feel very proud about that. Right? So we are in that area where we are considered a balanced market. Remember, 45 to 60 days on the market. All right. Not until close, but on the market until a contract comes in as as the average. Right. Um, sellers are, need to do stuff on their house to get the house ready to show. Buyers can be a lot more aggressive with their offers than they could over the last three or four years. And we're still seeing on the street. Some agents are just not figuring that out. Uh, I don't know if they're part timers. I don't know if the, maybe they just took summer vacation off. They just got back from Machu Picchu or whatever, you know, haven't caught up on the news and whatnot. But, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely in a balanced market right now. And there's a lot of agents out there who have never, I mean, the last balanced market we had was 2014. All right. Now think about that. That's eight years ago. That is four license renewals right? in an industry where the 80% of people never review, renew their license 
after they got it the first time. They're like, yeah, no nah, dog, this is not for me, right? So we, ha we have an entire generation out there who has not lived in this, experienced this kind of market before. So it's going to be interesting to see how they transition if their brokers are on board with leading them to, hey, you know, this is how we do these things, if they can get a hold of their brokers. Um, I'm really proud here that, you know, uh, we were starting to do that. Remember the special financing thing? All right. We were talking ab about that about two or three weeks before we started to see the lenders start going, hey, guys, you can offer special financing. Or we were already there over here at ProStar. And, um, you know, it's one of the nice things uh, about working with a crotchety old man who's been around for forever, all right, is he's seen it all. All right, so you can come down the pike and say, oh, yeah, all right, I've seen this before. You know, we got to go, go over there and do this. So and that's where we'd be. So, um, but they also confirmed the listings are dropping sharply. Okay, they're not coming on as fast as they were, you know, two, three, four, five weeks ago. All right, they do seem to be leveling off. Demand is starting to come up. And the other conversation that they had, and this was, you know, today's, or actually they, they did this one a couple of days ago, is they really do track the iBuyers. That's your offer pad, your open door, you know, those guys. And need, let's just say open door has a lot of inventory, right? They have, they're currently holding about 2,500 homes, right? 2,500 homes, right? And out of that, all right, they got most of them listed, but some of them are in that transition period where they're still cleaning them out and everything, getting them ready to go. All right, but between OfferPad and Open Door, all right, they represent about 11% of the market right now. All right, so 11% of the homes that you, you see out there are one of these two guys, and they have two very distinct, different business models. Right, uh, OfferPad, right, is still trying to make money on their transaction. All right, so they are not as um, accepting of a low ball offer, right? Much like Open Door, it really looks like Open Door, and this is my opinion because I, you know, but they almost look like they're trying to buy market share by crowding out the other competition. Open Door, they've already gotten rid of Zillow by basically underpricing their product right and this <clears throat> this is this is something if this is international trade we'd be going to the international trade union right now going hey you're dumping houses on our market and um but they're willing to take a loss and they're taking an average loss. every open door sign you see out there the odds are they're actually losing money in the long run on that and that sort of tracks with some of my own personal anecdotal evidence that I've seen with a couple of houses that I've tracked is that they're willing to take a hit on these things. OfferPad is definitely still trying to make money. And you can see that reflected in the offers that they send you. OfferPad, when you request an, uh, a, a bid from them, you know, they, they come in pretty low, right? So they're, they're trying to make money. They're trying, I think they're playing the long game and Open Door is trying to crowd, crowd them out. So we see, be interesting to see who wins on that. There's definitely a space for that in this marketplace. Um, you know, normally that position was handled by wholesalers, the I need to get rid of this house fast, or real estate agents who had a line of investors back up in the back of their head. So, okay, you need this fast, let me go talk to my guy. I, I got a guy. So, um, be interesting to see how that how that plays out. Well, remember, a lot of people just a year or two ago were saying open door and offer pad were the reasons why there wasn't any houses on the market. Right, that these guys were tying them all up. <clears throat> and that's a lot different than, let's say, an um, um, investor who's going to go in there, buy a house, and just sit on it for six months and leave it empty. Because right? an offer pad house, they do want to turn it over. They do want to get put keys in somebody else's hands and make money on that deal. And so basically they were just an extra step in the process. Right? Instead of the buyer or the seller hiring Ray, right, to sell to a buyer, right? It was open sell to open door, open door then sells, and that takes a lot longer because now you have two transactions instead of just the one, right? So, yeah. So that's what's going on with open door. The other article I wanted to talk about, and this is this actually gets into my conversation that I was having last night, all right? And um, conversation that's been coming up during the course of the day, and it actually also calls back 
to an episode that we had a couple months ago right, where a young man millennial um, had made a comment on Facebook about housing not being available for his generation. And I, I made some comments and everything like that. And, you, you know, if you if you watch that episode, you know, I had some comments about that. And so I'm, I'm sitting here talking to these two young men last night. One is an ICU nurse. Right? And the other one is a hospital administration. Right? And definitely 20s out having a good time trying to pick up the chicks at the bar kind of stuff. More power to them. And the, um, you know. Here are some kids who are just like winning at adulting, all right? They go, they got their job, they got their careers, all right? ICU nurses can make bank. I'm actually su surprised he's not traveling. Um, one of our lenders here in-house was telling me about one of his uh, clients right now who is a traveling nurse, and she's pulling in, he said, over six figures being a traveling nurse, right? now, she, But she wants a house as a home base of operations, and so... You know, nursing, uh, and I think if I remember right, you can actually be a nurse with two years of training, right? An associate's degree level of training, right? And then there's various levels of nursing and, you know, so and with more education requirements on that. But two years in and bam, you have the potential to travel the world and do these traveling gigs and whatnot and make some serious money. You know, for you guys out there trying to figure out what you do, with, want to do with the rest of your life, um, go check that out, right? And I mean guys too, right? You know. um, so these guys li live like right, right across the street at the former condominiums that are now apartments across from Rosie's. And, um, you know, I wasn't talking work last night, so I didn't hit them up on their housing thing. But between the two of them, either one of them are probably in a position to buy. They just might not know it. Right. Um, they might have student loans to pay off, right? Um, some lenders do not include student loans, all right, in your total debt to income, all right? C call a lender on that one. That's a lender conversation, not a rate conversation. Um, but earlier this week, um, had a closing. Young man that I've known, you know, I almost said before he was conceived, but, you know, it's like, I, I, I know this family for forever, all right? And with this man, this young man, getting his house at the age of 27, mind you, all right? All right and I took a picture of him opening up the key, opening up the door to his house to post on Facebook like I always do. All right? And I got some comments on the side. It's like, hey, my God, how old is he? I'm like, well, he's 27 years old, and he is buying his first house. Right, he is winning. All right, and he's got a very good track of how he was going to go about doing it. He had a plan, and he executed on his plan. Right, so um, got a great house, got under contract. Inspections went smooth. Everything was fine, except except we had like nine people at the inspection. Right, we had me, the inspector, all right, the buyer, and like the buyer's entire family. All right, all decided to show up, and everybody had questions and whatnot. But um, great, great, great transaction. And, th and I realized that I have actually put that entire family in houses now. Mom and dad have their house. Daughter has her house. Now the son has his house. All right, so it's my first hat, hat trick. If you, have, if you have a family out there in need of housing, all right, I will take care of your entire family for you. So, right. And so... I'm not saying that this does not make home purchasing suddenly easy because I come up with this one person and go, well, he did it. Why can't you? All right. But there is a big difference in the location and places that he was looking at, all right, as opposed to other buyers I've had in the past who just wanted zip codes they could not afford to live in. And they weren't willing to look outside of those zip codes. They, wanted, they weren't willing to go where their wallet could buy them a house. And I think I touched on that in the last conversation I had um, with a previous episode is that people tend, you know, um, we have issues with these first-time home buyers who are not buying a starter home. They're not looking at starter homes. They want the four-bedroom, two-bath right out of the gate. Right? And then when they can't get one at the price that they can afford, they go, oh, well, I can't afford a house. It's like, no, you can't afford a house, all right? You just can't afford that house. You need to look at that house over there, all right? And... Where that, well, that, where this whole journey starts, young person, 
as I'm as I'm going to get old and decrepit and snarky on you and talk to talk with all my age and experience, right? All right, Skippy, here's your problem. Your problem is you don't have a plan, right? So take some time out. If you are a th- young person who wants to eventually own a house sooner or later, start pl- making that plan now. How how are you going to save? You know, that three and a half percent. I tell people you should have at least five, right? Do you have a, a relative who might be able to gift you some of that? Like maybe an er- early inheritance. Maybe you have a relative who's in, you know, that you're in their will and they could slip on a bar of soap in the kitchen at midnight. Something like that, right? Just saying. So, but. I guess I just want to wrap up is that, you know, talking with these young men, you know, about Lord of the Rings, just completely geeking out on that and vast knowledge of lore and experience. And then getting this young man in the house is like, I like this younger generation. I like I like this. These 20 somethings. Oh, my God, they are on it. We were mentioned that a couple of years ago. Uh, me and Jeff, the lender, we put a kid in the house out in Goodyear. A kid, he was 23 and buying his first house. He had a plan, and he was executing. I mean, just amazing. When I was 23, 23 years old, I wasn't planning dinner. You know, I don't know what I was doing, but definitely wasn't getting ready to buy a house. So, but they might be the last generation of homeowners, right? And this is where I'm going to start waxing a little political and whatnot, and um, maybe even throw my opinion out. But they start a call right here called Rent Forever and Love It is from a website called the american mind um trigger warning this is a conservative site they do have a conservative bent that comes straight out and say hey we're a conservative site so if you sit there and going why this thing this does not seem fair and balanced no it's not it's biased all right but at least they come out and tell you it's biased but he's talking about the author here joel cotton k-o-t-k-i-n Kotkin, all right, he's talking about how housing is becoming commodified. Right? Uh, it's being treated as a commodity instead of an asset. And you remember when I was talking earlier about housing as a necessity, right? They're looking at people meeting that necessity by renting and being a tenant as opposed to being a homeowner. Right? And he it's, it has a pretty good conversation here about talking about how after World War II, the growth of the middle class was not just, you know, retooling after the war effort. It wasn't just the fact that we had the basically the only economy that hadn't taken a 500-pound general-purpose bomb into the factory, right? And we had a workforce that mostly survived World War II. Because remember, some you know Germany. Look at their ca- look at their casualty rates. Look at Russia. Look at Japan. Right. Uh, look at the you know uh, these other co- these other countries were devastated. Right. We weren't. We never got devastated. Right. The Luftwaffe did not fly 170 Fokker Wolf 200s over Detroit and took out the Ford Motor Plant. That just doesn't happen. Right. But. Because of those jobs and because we actually had the uh, industry in place to start rebuilding the rest of the world, we had a lot of employment, and we also had a lot of first-time home buyers, and we had a lot of people who started buying homes. Um, I should. This is one of those numbers I should have marked out because I really wanted to call this one out. Anyways, I can't find the, I can't find the number right now, but it's it was like prior to World War II, home ownership ownership was like only thirty percent of the population, right? I mean, we we start getting upset if we're under sixty right now, right? So that started that middle class, and a lot of the wealth that came out of the fifties and sixties was people actually buying a house, earning equity in it paying off their loan on it, not just making a 2000 or whatever it was back in those days. I remember my first house I paid $100 for a month, all right? So $100 a month, all right, of which X amount is paying off a loan and a certain amount of that is paying off the principal, 
all right, where the interest in the principal eventually turns into a house that you own or $100 renting for the rest of your freaking life. And so at the end of the day, you have no equity. You have no generational wealth. You don't have a house you could pass down to the kids. All right? You don't have a house that the kids can get together, sell, and divvy up the proceeds after you shuffle off your mortal coil. All right? This And I really wish I've, I could find this again because I'm, I'm full on soapbox right here. But I read the article once that was talking about Oprah Winfrey's family. And one of the reasons why Oprah Winfrey, Oprah, Oprah, oh, the reason why Oprah had the opportunity to be successful is because her grandfather bought land and defended the, the fact that he was going to keep that house. And because he owned that land, the downstream generational benefits happened from there, right? This is why when we have immigrants come in, right, a lot of immigrants come in and, you know, first thing they want to do is buy, they want to own a house. They want to own something of their own, and they use that, right? That's why you tend to see that second, third generation of immigrants coming in. Um, if m mom and dad, first generation, gets a house secured, after three generations, their numbers, their employment numbers, their, their crime numbers, everything, income numbers, all right, pretty much na matches the rest of America. And in certain certain immigration um, um, cohorts, you know, from certain countries, they do a lot better than, than we do. Why? Because they got mom telling us that, you know, I was in a freaking rice paddy 20 years ago. I wish I could have gone to college. You're going. And no, you're not taking that degree. You're getting a real degree, right? My son, the engineer. Yeah. My doctor, the lawyer. My doctor, the lawyer. <laughs> My daughter, the lawyer. You know, whatever it's going to be. So, anyways. Read, read this article. It really is talking about how um, various people, uh, it's uh, this whole urbanism thing of, oh, we should all be move in big cities. Oh, suburbs are icky and bad, and you have to drive cars to get there and back, and you got to mow lawns. And you so, oh, look at all those ticky tacky little houses, you know. And now I got ticky tacky houses stuck in my head. Um, or bad, bad, bad. We should all live in cubes in 12 story apartment buildings and stuff like that. So. Needless to say, I'm not a big fan of apartment living. I did it when I was young, back there when I was like doing that 23-year-old things and wasn't really planning for stuff. So, long story short, um, that's the end for this week. Remember, we have 20-somethings out there buying houses because they made a plan. They're executing on it. All right, you can too. All right, if you're in that situation where you go, oh, I will never. Talk to me first. I will tell you. No, you will never. All right. But I'm pretty sure there's a way. It's going to hurt. It's going to be uncomfortable. All right. It's not going to be fun. All right. But at the end of the day, if we do everything right, one of these days, you two will be opening a door and I'll be taking your picture to throw it up on Facebook. And you start by that by working your circles, watching kids and pets around water, having a great weekend. And I'll talk to you guys all later.